Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in and thank you to the Native Plant Society of Texas for the opportunity to submit a presentation today. Unfortunately, I couldn't be here with you virtually. Uh, the good news is we have Richard Halborn with us from Texas Parks and Wildlife Department who has so graciously offered to be on hand to answer any questions after the recorded presentation. Also, please take note of our email address on the slide, uh, which I'll include on the inside as well. And if you have any lingering questions, please do not hesitate to reach out. Today, I'll be talking about the Recovering America's Wildlife Act. There is incredible momentum building for this uh, very important uh, federal legislation that would be the most significant of its kind in a generation if it were to pass and would be truly transformative for our at-risk fish and wildlife and plants as well. The Native Plant Society of Texas is one of our 170 alliance partner organizations in the state. And we are just so thankful to all of the members who have already been involved with this effort, raising awareness of the bill and uh, reaching out to your members of Congress. And if you're new to the legislation, I'm delighted that you're here. And um, I'll be talking a, a bit later on about how you can get involved uh, to help get this exciting legislation passed. So again, thanks for being here. I'm going to start off today with a tale of two toads. I'm not sure if you'll recognize this little guy, but this is the Houston toad. And you might have heard about them in relation to Bastrop, Texas, which is one of the few remaining places they can be found. The Houston toad is an endangered species and has been since the early 70s, and they haven't been found in their namesake city, uh, Houston, since I believe the, the late 1970s. Several years ago, I had the opportunity to work on Houston toad conservation programs, and that included participating in field surveys during the breeding season. And the first time I saw a Houston toad in the wild was in 2008 in a county where they hadn't been documented in several years. And after many surveys and sleepless nights, we found a lone male toad by a cattle tank on the side of the road, singing his little heart out at about one o'clock in the morning. And sadly, most likely for a female toad that was probably not going to make it to the pond. There's potentially as little as a few hundred of these guys left scattered across a small handful of counties. And so uh, for me personally, this was a very uh, impactful experience. So the Houston toad has had a lot of setbacks, but it's not to say there's not hope for, for the species. There are public and private partnerships working very hard to bring them back from the brink of extinction. But this first example is to highlight one of the overarching ideas behind the Recovering America's Wildlife Act, and that is to keep at-risk species from getting to this point in the first place. Historically, and it has a lot to do with having a lack of resources, we've taken a reactive approach to wildlife conservation. And unfortunately, once we get to this point uh, with just a handful of individuals left, we know that recovery can sometimes take decades and decades and decades and significant capacity and resources to recover them. And then not to mention the conflict that can often be associated with uh, listed species as well. So it really is better for wildlife and everyone that we act sooner rather than later and invest proactively in declining species before they get to this critical point. And this takes me to the second toad in my tail, which is really not a toad, but affectionately known as one, our, horn, our horny toad, the Texas horn lizard. The Texas horn lizard is a Texas icon, our state reptile, and for many my age and older, and still for some in parts of the state, a very fond childhood memory. I spent some time in the summers as a child on my grandparents' property in the Panhandle, and I remember these little guys being everywhere, and I loved to watch them, and um, they really sparked a love of wildlife early on for me. And as I got older, I really felt a sense of loss as they became more difficult to, to find and see. Although the horn lizard has declined over the decades, they've still persisted in parts of the western third of the state. And this is a little hatchling that I photographed in the panhandle close to Canyon, Texas, just a few years ago. 
The great news is there is a lot of interest in public and private lands conservation. There are many landowners who would love to see them reintroduced on their properties. There are a few Texas zoos that are breeding them in captivity for reintroductions. And uh, we just had another reintroduction a, a few weeks ago, and you may have seen some news uh, about that. So although they're on our state threatened list, these guys are not at the critical point yet of the Houston toad, which is an excellent time to invest in them. So the horned lizard for us is really one of our Texas ambassadors for the types of programs that could be implemented or expanded if the Recovering America's Wildlife Act passes uh, for hundreds of other species across the state as well and thousands across the country. So Texas always does things big and our state's biodiversity is no exception. And one of the things that makes Texas so biodiverse is in part due to our massive size our state includes a number of different ecoregions, and all of these ecoregions have unique geology and hydrology and climate and support very unique animal and plant communities. From pronghorn antelope in the Trans Pecos and High Plains, to red headed woodpeckers in the towering piney woods in East Texas to hooping cranes uh, in winter where I grew up around our Gulf Coast prairies and marshes, to our Texas tortoises and the dense thorn scrubs of South Texas. Our ecoregions have also given rise to many endemic wildlife and plants only found in Texas. For example, one of my favorites is the Texas wild rice where I live in San Marcos. I love to spend many a Saturday morning watching from the bridge above and all of the turtles and fish who forage and take cover within the wild rice. This aquatic plant is found only on the upper San Marcos River in Hayes County and nowhere else on the planet. And a question I've gotten a lot over the years, especially working with rare species, and perhaps this is one you have gotten too, is why does all this biodiversity or plant and animal life matter? Why should we care? Well, for many of us, and I know I'm in good company here, uh, believe that wildlife and, and our native plants you know, have intrinsic value, that is value for their own sake. And I believe it's my ethical responsibility to help steward other species I share the planet with. For me, nothing gives me so much joy than seeing wildlife in my own backyard. For example, the, the pollinators who visit my native flowers, they bring me so much happiness and meaning into my life as well. And especially over the last year, folks have really turned to the plants and animals in their own backyard for much needed respite during the pandemic. And I know many of you are here again because you feel similar. So fish and wildlife and our time in nature obviously enhance our lives in so many ways. And I also think it's important to remember, and especially from a public policy perspective, and one that is quite honestly often overlooked, is that fish and wildlife are critical to our economy, to jobs, to livelihoods, and to our health and well-being. And you may have heard the term ecosystem services before. I like to call them nature's benefits or as sometimes our natural capital. For example, pollination services, not only the flowers and veggies in our backyard gardens, but pollinators are responsible for giving us about one third of our global food supply. In the United States, not counting honeybees, our native wild pollinators, our bumblebees, native bees, beetles, wasps, are estimated to provide a three to nine billion dollar per year service to US agriculture. And we often think of bees and hummingbirds as pollinators, but also bats are big pollinators. Either through pollination or seed dispersal or pest control, Bats give us foods like avocado, bananas, chocolate, figs, cashews, and many more. And uh, in the example of the Mexican lawn nose bat, who can be found in Texas, is perhaps responsible for pollinating one of the most important plants, and that is agave that gives us tequila and margaritas. So very important service there. Our bats also provide critical insect control services. 
Across Texas, bats emerge on summer evenings from caves, old railroad tunnels, from under city bridges to gorge on insects, which collectively amounts to tons over an evening. This is a video from Bracken Cave, which is just outside of San Antonio, the largest known maternal bat colony in the world, over 15 million Mexican free-tailed bats. And this is arguably one of the most amazing wildlife spectacles to see in person on our planet and right here in Texas. The bats at Bracken Cave are estimated to consume 200 tons of insects per night. And research has shown that their insect control is worth 1.4 billion annually for agriculture in Texas alone. For example, with the cotton bollworm moss that they consume. And this value includes uh, reduced crop loss to insect pests, reduced spread of crop diseases, and reduced need for pesticide application. Plants, fish, and wildlife are also important parts of systems that provide clean water in our rivers and watersheds. For example, our freshwater mussels, we have more than 50 species in Texas that filter water, help to stabilize river bottoms, and provide food to fish and other wildlife. Another very important thing that fish and wildlife and their habitats provide to us is ample outdoor recreation opportunities. Outdoor recreation, depending on what you're doing, either completely depends on or is greatly enhanced by healthy fish and wildlife. It is a critical booming part of our economy. So whether you're a fisherman, a biker, a hiker, a paddler, you are supporting local communities when you visit towns and you fill up your gas tanks, you shop at local stores, you eat at restaurants, you are supporting many jobs and livelihoods and small businesses. One really important and growing sector of our outdoor recreation economy is known as nature tourism. For example, in Texas, we have 4.4 million wildlife watchers, including 2.2 million birders and about 45 million birders nationwide. And Texas is a premier birding hotspot in North America. Migrating birds rely on Texas wild habitats, agricultural lands, coasts, cities for fueling up and getting rest before moving on or wintering here in Texas. And folks flock from all over the world to bird in Texas. And this brings an incredible amount of support to local economies. And of course, there's countless other benefits that we don't have time to cover all of them today uh, from the role of wildlife habitat as natural, uh, natural infrastructure, and flood control and carbon sequestration. But I wanna mention lastly, the mental and physical benefits that time and nature get the there has been countless research that shows that time and nature can reduce depression, and lift our spirits. It can do so much for us psychologically and physically um, like reducing stress hormones, blood pressure. And we know, especially for children, that time in nature results in happier and healthier kids. And I dare any person to sit with monarchs and queens in a sea of mist flower and wildflowers and not feel profoundly better and happier for it. Moving on to a topic that does not make one happy, um, we are facing big challenges in the United States in regards to species declines and our, much of our natural heritage and many of nature's benefits are at risk. We often think of wildlife declines as something happening somewhere else in the world and someone else's backyard, but we're witnessing alarming declines right here in North America. Roughly one third of our nation's wildlife are at increased risk of extinction and states have identified working with um, experts and biologists across the country 12,000 species of greatest conservation need and that includes about 1300 here in Texas. And these species are priorities for wildlife conservation for state wildlife agencies across the country. I wanted to show you uh, this graph here so you can get a visual of what a species of greatest conservation need is. At the top of the graph, we have stable populations. Um, SGCNs, I'll use their acronym from here on, are those wildlife populations where biologists believe stability is declining and then all the way down to those that are already threatened or endangered and very close to extinction. But the vast majority of these species are those that haven't reached that critical point yet. 
And although the Recovering America's Wildlife can also help recover endangered species and help delist them too, the overall proactive and preventative concept behind the Recovering America's Wildlife Act, and one that has so much bipartisan support, is um, this concept to allocate resources for conservation before it gets to um, this point and to help prevent wildlife from becoming endangered in the first place. So just to run quickly through a couple of examples where we're witnessing these declines and um, you know these may not be news to you. Uh, for example, pollinators, butterflies, many invertebrates are experiencing declines. Uh, the beloved monarch butterfly, our state insect, right up there with the Texas horn lizard as an adored Texas icon, a gateway species um, to learning about native plants. Many issues have been implicated in these declines, and one especially for monarchs is habitat loss, and specifically loss of native milkweed habitat, um, like this uh, antelope horn here that I videoed close to my house, uh, monarchs needing uh, milkweeds for the caterpillar stage of their life cycle. And so many of our insects are married, if you will, to specific native plants and that they've um, co-evolved these relationships over time and really depend on each other. So this loss of native plants and plant communities, very detrimental to pollinators and other invertebrates. And thank goodness for the Native Plant Society of Texas, who is connecting us to opportunities to find and learn about native plants and their relationships with wildlife, like pollinators and birds, um, native plants also being our best bird feeders. Which brings me to bird declines. Um, in 2019, we learned uh, that in less than a single lifetime, North America has lost more than one in four of its individual birds and um, collectively 2.9 billion breeding birds since 1970. And these declines have happened in almost every ecosystem and even with some of our most common birds. To mention one a group in particular, we're seeing steep declines in grassland birds, 720 million grassland birds lost since 1970. For example, the eastern meadowlark, uh, we've lost three out of every four individuals. Iconic sound of our grasslands and prairies where I grew up around the Houston area. And as we lose the associated grasslands that insects rely on, we lose the grasslands that these birds uh, rely on for foraging. Many grassland birds also, you know, requiring the native bunch grasses for, for cover and nesting sites. And these are just a couple of examples, um, but we are also seeing alarming declines in coastal birds, woodland birds, freshwater mussels, bats, amphibians, reptiles, and many small mammals, and the list goes on and on. So we obviously have some big challenges ahead, and action is needed now for, for our at-risk and vulnerable wildlife. Understanding the implications of these wildlife declines, both economically and ecologically, every state actually has a congressionally mandated plan to address at-risk species. Ours is uh, the, the Texas Conservation Action Plan, and it is our roadmap to implement actions that will help recover and stabilize species in their habitats and helping us to prevent at-risk wildlife from becoming endangered. Unfortunately, we don't have the dedicated sufficient funding needed to um, implement these plans, and especially for non-game wildlife. The vast majority of species in decline today are non-game, those that are not hunted or fished, and they're funded at less than 5% of what's needed to be effective. And I don't know if we have any hunters or anglers tuning in, but often people are surprised to learn that funding for wildlife conservation since 1937 has primarily been paid for through an excise tax collected on sporting equipment. And much of this funding goes to game species. And with these funds, we have been able to bring back elk, pronghorn, white-tailed deer, turkey from the brink of extinction. And even in that last recent bird decline report, um, one of the only groups of birds that haven't declined and populations have actually been increasing is waterfowl. 
which a lot of people believe um, is because of the wetland conservation efforts from this sort of funding and funding from like the duck stamp. And so it's a testament as to what can be accomplished with dedicated funding for wildlife and habitat conservation. Another issue here is that hunting is on the decline. And when you couple that with the fact that uh, most of the species in decline today are non-game, it's very critical that we enact a new supplemental funding model for wildlife conservation that will help conserve both game and non-game wildlife for future generations. And we know from all the things we've already talked about um, today that investments made in wildlife and habitat conservation in our country will reap benefits tenfold. So knowing the implications of the funding challenges, there was a national blue ribbon panel assembled. And this was a diverse group that looked at different funding options and solutions. And panel members included leadership from conservation organizations, businesses, representatives from the industry sector, sportsmen groups, and many others. And the final recommendations from this panel are reflected in the Recovering America's Wildlife Act legislation. This bipartisan federal legislation would direct 1.3 billion annually of existing revenues to states for wildlife conservation. About 97.5 million annually would go to tribal nations as well. Of this, Texas would be eligible for more than 50 million per year annually, which would truly be a game changer for us. Texas Parks and Wildlife would be stewards of the funding, and then they would make the funding available through grants um, to benefit those species of greatest conservation need and their habitats. Conservation organizations, land trusts, nature centers, zoos, and many others would be able to apply for these grants. Also, very exciting addition to the bill in this Congress, and one that will uh, make folks tuning in very happy. The bill explicitly includes plants as eligible for funding. So plants, i.e. flora, were added to the definition of species of greatest conservation need in this bill. The bill clarifies that plants are crucial to healthy habitats for fish and wildlife, and it provides flexibility for state fish and wildlife agencies to fund um, plant conservation efforts when working towards implementation of the state wildlife action plans. So it will add a financial incentive for states to include plants in their list of state SGCNs, which is um, good news is that the good news is that Texas already does and um, in the conservation planning and habitat prioritization effort of their state wildlife action plans. States that meet the requirement will receive an additional 5% of their apportioned amount to restore native plants. And in Texas, we understand the estimate, although don't be, hold me to it as this is an, just an estimate right now, but um, this could uh, be more than two and a half million dollars per year. And overall, this would amount to about $55 million per year across the country, which is awesome news for plant conservation. So where would the funding go? Roughly 85% of projects would go towards direct efforts that help vulnerable species in their habitats. To start, research to inform action. Many of our species of greatest conservation need, we know very little about them because there's so little funding. Where do they go? What do they do? What are the issues impacting them? And what tools are going to be helpful recovering populations so we can move to that conservation action stage? Funding will especially need to go towards habitat restoration and management. So many of our non-game uh, species are dealing with issues associated with habitat. So it would help us invest more in our land, whether that be public or private, controlling invasive plants, prescribed fire, native habitat restoration, more small and large scale habitat work to help our pollinators and birds and other uh, vulnerable wildlife. Also, funding for land acquisition and being able to set up voluntary conservation easements with private landowners connected with priority species um, and for those that are not already threatened or endangered would be a biggie for Texas. 
also of significance for Texas, as we are primarily a private land state, is that Recovering America's Wildlife Act would allow us um, to provide more support to private landowners through technical assistance, um, for example, to help landowners get the knowledge and equipment assistance they need to restore and manage at-risk wildlife habitat on their properties. It could also help to expand cost share programs um, for landowners to restore and manage wildlife habitat for SGCNs. It could help us fund more positions uh, of private lands biologists who can focus on non-game wildlife and be there to help block landowners through the process. In regards to habitat restoration, I wanted to give just one example of you know, the type of projects that could have big impacts for multiple species of um, conservation need. For example, in South Texas, we have the endangered ocelot and the state-threatened Texas tortoise and others that thrive in uh, the dense thorn scrub habitat there. And much of this habitat has been cleared for farmland or other reasons or has been taken over by invasive vegetation. And a biologist from Texas Parks and Wildlife was telling me that this native thorn scrub habitat can take up to like 100 years to grow back naturally. These are very diverse vegetative communities that, that some of you might know quite a lot about. Um, so to do the invasive vegetation control um, and site prep to head start and restore these native plants uh, and plant communities is very expensive and laborious. It can cost as much as $100,000 to work towards restoring just 20 acres of land. And these are on properties where we already have uh, protected land that we just need to invest in to make it more suitable for, for vulnerable wildlife. Uh, there are also interested private landowners, but there's just not the human capacity and resources um, to work at the level we need to. So recovering would just be so transformative in this regard. Another thing that it could fund is wildlife head starting and captive breeding and reintroduction programs. And this is a conservation tool that is usually reserved for the most endangered species. And it's been successful at bringing many back from the brink of extinction. Um, one example of a captive breeding project in Texas is the Atwater's Prairie Chicken, one of the country's most endangered birds. Um, the Atwater's Prairie Chicken was one of the first species listed as endangered. And I think once numbered, it's something like a low of 12 birds. Numbers of prairie chickens have been brought back up, although there's still a long way to go. I think I read this year, it's they're at a 30 year high at 178 birds. And this is thanks in part to the captive breeding and reintroduction effort at the Atwater's Prairie Chicken National Wildlife Refuge. They're being uh, captively bred and the chicks are raised and then soft released at the site, eventually returning to the prairie to be wild chickens. And I used to work at the Houston Zoo and had the opportunity to go see them at the NASA Space Center um, where uh, they have the breeding facility. They call them space chickens because of that. And then saw the entire process of them coming to the prairie to be released. And then not long after, I went to a festival at the refuge and had the opportunity to see this wild hen cross the road. Um, just one of the neatest experiences of my life. And of, uh, of course, we also know that there are no Atwater's Prairie chickens without coastal prairie habitat. And so much work to protect and restore coastal prairie is necessary for endangered species like the prairie chicken and the many grassland birds that rely on these diverse prairie communities. But with passage of the Recovering America's Wildlife Act, we could also expand more reintroduction projects with species that are not endangered yet, like the Texas horn lizard. The Fort Worth Zoo, the Dallas Zoo, and San Antonio Zoo are breeding horn lizards in captivity, and there have been reintroductions in the past few years at a wildlife management area. And of course, also habitat management and restoration at these sites are key to providing new homes for the lizard. This is from a release a few years ago, this little guy from the Fort Worth Zoo um, already gobbling up ants, so cool. How great would it be to ramp up this program and see horned lizards return to places that they haven't been seen in decades? Very exciting stuff. 
15% of funding could also go towards education and outdoor recreation programs and infrastructure, wildlife viewing platforms, new wildlife viewing trails, outdoor gear learner programs, um, programs for stakeholders to learn about wildlife and, and how they can help, projects in urban areas that create um, uh, native habitats and outdoor biology classrooms for, for schools and students. There's just so much that could be done with this portion of the funding to engage more Texans in um, at-risk species conservation and plant seeds of change with the future stewards of our state. So recovery would clearly be transformative for wildlife conservation in Texas and across the country. So where does it stand? We have high hopes for the bill in this session and are excited to build on the success from the last 116th Congress. In the last session, the House bill reached many milestones and went further than it ever had. And Texas acquired um, co-sponsors from over one third of our delegation from Texas. And we've gotten uh, this question a lot in this session. Um, some folks think that the Recovering America's Wildlife are, are already passed in the last session. Well, um, in the last Congress, a five-year authorization of the act did pass the U.S. House of Representatives as part of a transportation package. Um, but in any two-year legislative session, a bill has to pass the House, the Senate, and be signed by the President, or it needs to be reintroduced again, uh, starting over with co-sponsors. So in the 117th Congress, in this current two-year legislative session that happened, uh, started in January 2021, um, the House bill uh, needed to be reintroduced again, and that happened on Earth Day, very fittingly. The bill number is HR 2773. The lead co-sponsors are Debbie Dingell, a Democrat from Michigan, and Jeff Fortenberry, a Republican from Nebraska. The House bill currently has um, 118 co-sponsors, including five Texans, and that was at the time of recording this video. It could be higher now. And it recently had a very positive hearing in subcommittee, and we would expect a vote in the House Natural Resources Committee um, in the coming weeks, and then uh, could move to the, to the House floor um, for a vote. Then on July 21st, we had a bipartisan Senate bill introduced by Martin Heinrich, a Democrat from New Mexico, and Roy Blunt, a Republican from Missouri. And that bill number is Senate Bill 2372. Very exciting. This bill is getting incredible momentum in the U.S. Senate, especially in the last couple of weeks. Um, we have 24 co-sponsors signed on, uh, very evenly split between Republicans and Democrats, and we have high hopes for the Senate bill moving forward uh, with this progress that we're seeing. The most important thing we can do right now um, to support the national effort is to show as much support as possible uh, for both of these bills through acquiring new bill co-sponsors. The national goal for the House bill is 200 co-sponsors. Uh, we're again at 118, and you can see a list of our current U.S. House representative co-sponsors from Texas here. If your representative is not among this list, let's get them on as a co-sponsor. In addition, uh, we need to also be doing as much outreach as possible to our U.S. Senator offices, and that would be Senator uh, Cornyn and Senator Cruz. So here in Texas, we're using the 200 by 200 goal for fall 2021, and that is we would like to generate uh, the 200 national co-sponsors, and Texans can help that goal by getting new U.S. House reps from Texas on the House bill. And we also want to generate um, at least 200 phone calls and messages each to Senator Cornyn and Senator Cruz's office. So there are many ways that you can help Recovering America's Wildlife Act efforts in Texas and reach out to your members of Congress. It is going to take our entire Texas community speaking uh, up for wildlife to get the support we need from members of Congress in Texas and ultimately get this legislation passed, which we know is going to benefit all of us. So first of all, one of the most important things you can do is contact your U.S. House representative um, and our U.S. Senators and ask them to co-sponsor Recovering America's Wildlife Act. 
You can do that by writing a letter, by posting a message to their website, um, or calling their office. If you want to do due diligence and triple your impact, do all of those things. You are a constituent in your district, you're a voter, and your voice really does matter. And if your representative co-sponsored in the last session, please send them a thank you and ask them to sign on again in this one. And if you need to know if your representative was a co-sponsor in the last section, you can just shoot us an email and we'll be able to give you that information. Also, um, please engage your professional and personal networks. Talk to five or more of your colleagues, neighbors, friends, family members. Ask them to reach out to their members of Congress, too, or any uh, uh, connections that they might have with offices. Also, help us engage new audiences and businesses, um, landowners, industry, ranches, uh, new organizations to join the Alliance. There are benefits of recovering to so many different interests, and we want them to join our state efforts. And as a Native Plant Society of Texas members, you can certainly help educate Texans about recovering through your newsletters, your educational events, and other communication outlets. And again, if you need assistance doing that, you would like some sample text, graphics, just shoot me an email and I'll work with you on getting everything that you need. And lastly, reach out to me to add your name to our district action alert email list. Uh, if you contact me and tell me what district you live in, I can put you on that list so you'll get alerts about particularly strategic times to reach out to your members of Congress, um, even if you've already done so. And those emails will provide sample messages and office contact information that you can then forward to folks in your network as well. I want to mention that we have an online toolkit with various fact sheets and flyers and resources, frequently asked questions, uh, draft letters to your members of Congress. We also, you can also find out there who your U.S. House representative is if you don't already know. We also have a wonderful Texas focus video on our website that you can share. And if it works, I'd like to try and give you a peek at our national video ad if you haven't already seen it, a wonderful video. And you can find that on our website as well and a link to our Vimeo account where you can actually download the video and share it on social media or use it in your communications outlets. Also, please reach out to me at any time and I can help assist you with resources that you might need. If you need any help finding out who your Congress member is or writing a letter or really anything, just reach out to us. To stay connected and updated, individuals can go to our website and sign up for our mailing list there. And this will get you general updates, our newsletter, general action alerts. And if you're with an organization or business that is not already part of the Alliance, again, the Native Plant Society of Texas is an Alliance member. Um, we encourage you to join for free by clicking the Join the Alliance button that you can find all over the website. If you'd like to sign up for those district action alerts, please contact us at info at txwildlifealliance.org. And here next, I am going to try to show you our national video ad. It's just a few minutes long. And um, if it doesn't end up working, you can access this on online at our website. One century ago, many animals in the United States were on the brink of extinction. Thankfully, we began aggressive conservation efforts that helped recover some of our nation's most iconic wildlife. These successes are largely due to conservation legislation and funding, giving us the resources to save our natural heritage. But many fish and wildlife species haven't had the benefit of conservation funding. Now there is a bill in Congress to remedy that. The Recovering America's Wildlife Act. One third of our bird species are in need of urgent conservation action. Many amphibians and reptiles are in decline across the country. Some of our fish are endangered and others are getting close. Pollinators that we depend on are struggling and some of our greatest wildlife migrations are disappearing. 
We have the science and ability to save many of these species. Now is the time to invest in the future of our wildlife. The Recovering America's Wildlife Act will dedicate $1.4 billion each year to conserve and restore our at-risk fish and wildlife. This act has strong bipartisan support, and it is not a new tax. Funding will go to conservation efforts in states, territories, and tribal lands that will help wildlife in the habitats they depend on. It will also connect more people to nature through outdoor recreation and education programs, which is good for our children and enriches our communities. Americans love and need our wild places, and we want to see our wildlife thrive. The Recovering America's Wildlife Act will ensure the health of fish and wildlife for generations to come. Ask your members of Congress to support the Recovering America's Wildlife Act. such an inspiring video. We had a very talented wildlife film company here in Texas who created this for state and national use. So again, uh, you can download that and share, um, and uh, you can access that at our website. With that, I just want to say thank you again uh, for tuning in today and to the Native Plant Society of Texas for having us and accommodating the recorded presentation. And again, thank you to all of you who have already been working to raise awareness and support for the Recovering America's Wildlife Act in Texas. And we look forward to working with you in the future. I am such a big admirer of uh, your care and passion for our native plants and how you act in your own gardens and neighborhoods and communities in ways that are so important for our native wildlife and for connecting Texans with nature. So thank you for all that you do. For those of you who learned about this legislation for the first time today, I hope you'll sign up for our mailing list and stay connected with how you can help. This really is such a wonderful bipartisan effort and it's great to work on something that so many folks have come together on uh, to help wildlife in Texas. And with that, you can contact us at this email address for any resources or questions that you have after today. And for any burning questions uh, or comments that you have now, we have Richard Halbrin with us from Texas Parks and Wildlife Department to help answer those. So thank you so much, Richard, and thanks again to everyone. I hope to see you soon.